we were really struggling. And I said no, because I'm dealing in property. In those six months, I lost money. You learn far, far more when things are tough, when you're up against it. If you don't like making tough decisions, you're not a captain. If you're not comfortable being captain of the ship, then you shouldn't be doing it. The auction market is the barometer and the heartbeat of the property market. When the auction market is tough, the rest of the property market follows. When it improves, it improves first with the auction. I get people whinging to me, how do you find a deal and I don't? So, well, that's life, there you go. You're not gonna get any then, are you? Most estate agents, they're nice people, they love a nice car, and they're not very good businessmen. You know what, I've heard it all before, yet yeah, I've got friends who've only bought in one town who've probably made as much money as me. Property's got no heart or soul, he's not passionate about it, he just wants to buy and sell it. I hate saying it, but it's true. Uh, I wanna make money. That's a great, great question. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Property People. Today, I'm delighted to be joined with Mr. John Howard. How are you today, John? I'm very well. How are you? Best day of my life. Fantastic. Well, it's always the best day because it's the current day, so that's great. Exactly. Tomorrow's going to be even better, and the best is yet to come. Fantastic. So, with a quick introduction, we've got a lot to get through because you've got an amazing, amazing track record that I want to um, have lots of nuggets that I'm sure that you can sh uh, share with all of our audience. Um, you've been in property and been a property professional for over 40 years. I have. Uh, boasting an impressive sale and purchase of over 3,500 homes. Uh, about four and a half now. Need to sack the researchers. Who sack the researchers. <laughs> um, apartments and developments within the UK. Um, having worked in residential and commercial property for many years, you've formed many partnerships with industry-leading uh, contacts with a strong public profile. Uh, you've been an estate agent, a member of the Conservative Party, uh, and most recently a stalwart on property TV, on Sky show, uh, which is on Sky, on shows like uh, The Property Elevator and The Property Graduate. Yes. Shows which I've watched myself and Fantastic. enjoyed. Fantastic. Well, that's nice. Good. Excellent. So you're talking to a fan as well as a property <laughs> aficionado. Um, Great. So before we get into it all, yes. I always like to find out what type of person were you at school? Were you um, studious? Were you rebellious? Uh, did you always know you'd want to be in property when you grew up? That's a great, great question. First of all, I was thick. That's, I was bottom of the class. Really? Uh, yes. So I wasn't, I wasn't very bright. I had bright ginger hair. I was away at boarding school and I stammered. Wow. That's not a good... That's not, that isn't the best start, but what it does do, um, and in those days, obviously, there was less PC as there is today, and, and, and it, it moulds your character because you have to yeah. be able to take a joke and you have to be able to give a joke as well, really. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I had quite a bad stammer until I was 19. How would you get rid of it? I, well, they don't know why people stammer. They still don't know why. I think it's to do with confidence and breathe, breathing, to be honest with you. And I went along to the Stammering Society a few years ago, and uh, the first thing they said to me, and I told them my story, and they were interested, and I made a donation and all the rest of it, it's a charity. And they said, uh, of course, you're still a stammerer, because you never lose it. But I said, well, mm, I'm not sure that's quite right, but they should know, they know more than me, don't they? So when you're under pressure, uh, you, what, you, what they say you do, you, you uh, avoid words that you stammer on. Right. You become right, very right. clever. Okay. And there's 500,000 people in this country that are stammerers, but their work colleagues don't know they are. Interesting. Which, but of course, when you stammer, uh, you don't stammer when you rhyme, you don't stammer when you shout, and you don't stammer when you sing. So if you're annoyed, no problem. Or if you're singing, I think there was a there was a case on I don't know property a pop idol or something. Yes, where there, there was. was What's yeah. Gareth, Gareth Gareth Gates? Gates. Yes, so yeah. he he never had an issue when he was singing. No, but he had you the don't. Issue. You don't. No, no stammerer stammers when they sing or when they rhyme. Is it a self perpetuating cycle as well, which is basically I'm uh, I lack confidence, therefore I stammer, and then I stammer, and therefore I lack confidence. A lot of stammerers are are uh, struggle at school as well. Until you know struggle at school, which is interesting. Was it, would you, did you struggle at school because um, you weren't interested in the subjects? No, just thick. Really? Because you don't come yeah. across as a very no. unintelligent person. No, no I, no, I really, really struggled at school. In fact, I gave up, they, they made me gave up virtually every O level possible wow. in order to get a few. So I even gave up maths, 
uh, which which is the one that everyone has to do. Uh, Wushi Sunak, of course, are my mate Wushi Sunak definitely wants everyone to do bloody math, so I can't understand that one. But um, yeah, so no, no, there. I literally gave up everything in order to get. I think I got three in the end. I was thinking about being a vicar for a little bit, well, a less, uh, one lesson or so, because I actually got my, I got my divinity or whatever it's called, um, O level. Oh, so, right. uh, but I realised there wasn't a lot of money in that, so I didn't think that was a very, a very good idea in the end. So with um, things like higher education, sounds like yes. you went to boarding school. Yeah. Like there's a, an onus on having getting a good education, especially yes. probably back then. Yes. Um, did you get to university? You're joking. I, I left after three O levels. Yeah. So, uh, so I left. Did, yeah. So tell me about the what the, the okay. The so path to work. well, my my father was a well. First of all. First of all, the reason I ended up at boarding school was because my grandfather in 1947 had two boys come into his shoe shop in Mansfield and he was so impressed with his two boys and the fact they went to Gresham School in Norfolk that he vowed to save enough money for all his grandchildren to go to private school. And he had three grandchildren and they, we all went to private school. So that's amazing really. And uh, my father was a greengrocer. Uh, he, he, he was quite a good businessman. He had a couple of shops in Felixstowe. He then decided when he was 60 that he wanted to be an estate agent. Now, on the Friday he was a greengrocer. On the Monday he was an estate agent. That's a bit of a problem <laughs> in terms of valuing houses. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he sort of got away with it. He bought, a, he bought an existing business uh, and then he wasn't very well. I got to... Um, 17 years old, so I could learn to drive. So I left school, I joined him. Um, right. And then after four months, he ended up back in hospital. I was running the business um, at 17 years, four months, making the right balls up of it. And this was sales and lettings? Yeah, we did, well, we did. In those days, you'd do everything. So you got such a fantastic grounding. So you did a, we hardly sold a house, but, but we're meant to be estate agents. Um, property management, insurance. Wow. We had an agency for the Leeds Permanent Building Society. My, so, my, as you know, I didn't get my mass O level, so that wasn't too clever. W working out how much, you know, working out how much to pay people and not as they came in for, for a withdrawal or deposit or whatever. So, but you've got a really good grounding. And the other thing it was, we were really struggling business-wise, which again, you learn far, far more when things are tough and when you're, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. when, you, when you're up against it. When the chips are down. When it's easy, when the market's rising, I always say when the market's rising, my dog could make as much money as, as anyone else. All, they got, all, he, all she's got to do is put a paw, her paw on a, on a contract. Yeah? But the difference is she doesn't know when to stop. Right, right, right. Whereas right. the brighter people hopefully know when to stop, when the market's going to turn. You're, um, so you're straight into the, the deep end of the world of work and you're yep. doing property management, yep. le sales, lettings, yep. insurance. yes. And how many people is running? Of course, not qualified in any shape or form to do any of those things, but that's beside the point. And, and yeah, and how, how many people <laughs> were you kind of, it was a family run business? It was a massive, massive business. It was me and Mrs. Leader, who used to give me spelling lessons every morning because she couldn't believe that I'd been to private school and couldn't spell. Wow. That was it, me and her. So, and in those days, you locked up and went home for lunch, of course. And how were you like generating lead? Was it just having a shop front? People would walk by, by or? Yeah, it was just an old fashioned state agents. I mean, we, there was five in the town and we were the worst. And why did your dad decide to go from the grocer to, to, to become an estate God agent? God knows, God only knows. I don't know why, I think he just fancied it. He had a little bit of money in the bank. And uh, I think what he did do, I remember him coming home one day and saying to my mother, there was a company called Downsway, which was a supermarket chain. And he said, Downsway are opening up in Felixstowe. That is the end right, right. of greengrocers. That's the end of a, a general stores. And my mother, I remember my mother went, yes, but Huey Green's opening the store, so I'm going to go and meet Huey Green. You remember Huey Green? You, no. probably don't. you don't know who Huey Green was? God, I'm so old. I'm so old. Um, he was on Opportunity Knocks. He ran Opportunity Knocks. Okay, no, the show Opportunity Knocks. Yeah. I can't say well, I the Huey it. Green, so he'd obviously go around for a few quid, would open up, cut the old ribbon. Right, right, right. So, right, right, so uh, yeah, so she was delighted because uh, Huey Green was in town. So she was like, he might, we yeah. might be going out of business, yeah. but I'm going to go and see yeah. the celebrity. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. 
That went down well. And then the estate agency was a business that came up for sale, decided, okay, we're going to diversify and we're going to go yeah, into that. So, so my father did that. We, we really struggled with it. Um, I realised after really a two or three months that this is a mugs game being an estate agent. The real, the real money is being, is being a problem, is buying and selling. Is it, right, and, I, okay. and that was a natural thing that I wanted to do. And on my 18th birthday, I managed to buy two properties. So Impressive. as I say to everyone, the first people to try and, and lend you some money are family, if you can. Now, my father wouldn't lend me any money because he said I didn't want to lose it. My mother, on the other hand, wanted a new kitchen, and my dad wouldn't pay for it. So she was willing to lend me some money at a decent interest rate and a share of the profit. So she lent me a little bit of money. The bank manager, we used to have them in those days, they lent me some money, and I'd saved about a 1,000 quid or something. And, and I managed to buy two regulated, sitting tenanted flats, um, which is what they were in those days. We, we bought a lot of them as the time went by, off a property developer that we knew uh, who was sort of a client of ours, and it was the rump end of the deal. They just wanted to shift these last two. So what I did before I bought them, I went to see both tenants, and I persuaded one of the tenants to buy the flat off me immediately because I bought it at a 50% discount oh, because right. it was a sitting tenant. I sold it to them at... Um, at um, 25% discount. Exactly, and we made a margin, and then I moved on from there. My mother got her money back. She got a new kitchen. She was delighted. And the first thing she said to me, when did we do the next deal? <laughs> yeah. And that's how it worked. <laughs> Roll into the next one. Roll them on. <laughs> Roll it on. What year was this? What were we talking oh, about? my goodness. 1979, uh, 81. You know, it was around 1980. The average house price in the 1980s is about £80,000. Yeah, I paid I paid £9,250 for these two flats in Felixstowe. Right, Day. right, yeah. right. Because, yeah, my, my old man was buying um, houses in the northeast, these two up, two down, coal mining pit villages, uh, properties in the northeast, County Durham, uh, in the 80s, yeah. and he was buying them for like two, three thousand. Yeah, seven, absolutely. Four, four, five I, 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 in those days, you could buy put, the whole streets in Liverpool, in, in Wales... In the northeast, you wouldn't just buy one; you'd buy a whole street, yeah, literally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get a grant off the government to put a bathroom in because none of them had bathrooms. You know, it's amazing how things have changed, isn't it? Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. And then that's why a lot of the bathrooms in the, today's market they're on the ground floor at the rear, absolutely behind the kitchen. Yeah, an extension that, because exactly. they've got, a, 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 and you could get a grant for it, so it was great. So it sounds like you got the bug for investment. And you thought that that's actually the best way to make I money. love trading, really. Trading. I mean, I'm a, you know, I've, I've done, as you know, big developments. But to be honest with you, I'm a, I'm a dealer. I'm a trader. And I, and I had someone come and, <laughs> um, come and listen to one of my seminars. I, I don't do many seminars because I'm really busy. But the ones I, anyway, came along. And he wrote an article afterwards. And he said, um, John Howard doesn't like property. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is to him. It's just a commodity. He's got no heart or soul to him. Property's got no heart or soul. He's not passionate about it. He just wants to buy and sell it. And actually, <laughs> to a point, they were, I thought, well, that's fair enough, really. Uh, I want to make money. You know, if I, can, if I can sell you a deal tomorrow, if I can buy something today and sell it to you the same day or tomorrow, I'll be delighted. Yeah, well, let's do let's do that in, in emerging markets like, for example, yes. Dubai, where they're flipping off off plant yeah, properties yeah. Uh, left, right, and centre. That's I think totally that, out of my league. I've never been out of England, hardly. So that's totally out. Of my yeah, league. and the, argue, the argument against it is that okay, you're inflate, artificially inflating prices, but it doesn't necessarily need mean. Uh, no, need but to mean it that. does stop in the end, and it goes the other way. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You need to know when. Have you ever done uh, the wealth dynamics? No like test. No, because there's one of the one of the things is like trader, and I'm always quite curious to see how people if they if they self-identify with something. Yeah, I thought I was something, and I turned out to be something else. So. Really? Yeah, <laughs> I was really disappointed with what I got. But then in the end, I was like, oh, I wanted to be a star or a trader or a dealer or property. Yeah, all those things, aren't you? Well, I ended up becoming a supporter, <laughs> which I was like, oh, that's so like lame. But actually, when I thought about it. Actually, I, I thought, okay, I, I, I can make this work. And actually, it probably is me more so than anything else. But I don't know, sometimes these things are self-fulfilling prophecies But, but, as but well. I want, what I always say to people, you know, even if they're, you know, if you're doing a, any sort of property deal, you are the captain of the ship. You know, everyone looks to you for payment, for decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have the responsibility. And if, you, if you're not comfortable being captain of the ship, then you shouldn't be doing it. 100%. Shouldn't be doing it.
let someone else do it. Invest the money with someone else or, or whatever. Uh, if, if you don't like making tough decisions and all the rest of it, you're not a captain. It makes sense. I and remember, the captain on a ship that's sinking is the last one to get off. Everyone else gets paid, hopefully. Everyone else gets looked after. Then it's you. Which isn't always the way when you sometimes hear of these businesses no, going but it, under. But it should be. It should be. Let's get political for just for a oh, minute. Oh, yeah. Just okay. for a second. Yep. Um, I know that you were part of the Conservative Party. Yes, I was chairman of Ipswich um, Conservatives and we won. So having won by the biggest majority, I quickly resigned. And then they made me president which is what they give, what they, I think they give that honour to anyone that's been a chairman, to be honest with you. But I had all sorts of run-ins with Central Office, which is the headquarters of the Conservatives, because um, I wasn't happy with the way we were dealt with as an association. And we, I was at loggerheads with them quite a lot, um, mainly about being able to get a, a candidate for the election at the time, because they said, oh, you, you don't need a candidate yet. So, yes, we do. We want a candidate in place. We want them someone who's going to move down into the area straight away and work very hard and canvas immediately, which eventually I got my way. But it was tricky. They didn't want to do it. They're very it, the Conservative uh, Party is, is a massive organisation, and it's, you know... Why, why did you choose, out of all the political parties, I mean, you've got the two main, which is going to be Labour and Conservative... Um, but There's only one party, isn't there? Conservatives, isn't there? <laughs> well, depending no. who you are, you know, you look at it. I say it quietly now. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not too proud at the moment. Well, so why, why did you choose the Conservative oh, well, party? The con well, it, it's a natural... What was it about their values? Yeah, it's the it? values, I think. And also, it's how you've been brought up, I think, as well, isn't it, to a point? I mean, uh, Conservatives is meant to be a party of low taxation. Now, I think those days are gone forever. Um, a, f uh, a friend of mine, he is the chairman of Suffolk County Council. And he told me the other day that the budget, 76% of his budget goes on adult social care. 76 of the whole budget of Suffolk County Council goes on adult social care. That's just not sustainable. And every yeah. council virtually is in the same boat. So there's no, they, these taxes that I don't think are ever going to come down. Under Labour, they'll get in, I think, next time, and they'll say, oh, uh, we didn't know it was as bad as it was. Um, anyone who's on 40, 45% tax is now on 60. That's what they'll do. Inheritance tax, they'll whack that up as well. Because, because it's, a, it's an easy sell for them. They're not hurting their own voters. Yeah, they're hurting yeah, the yeah. Conservative voters. And, um, you know, conservatism is about aspiration and right. letting people get on uh, with their lives, not interfering too much, hopefully, and making money. Uh, and Labour is all about the big picture and making it so that everyone everyone's equally well off, basically, which never happens. It's, it's, it's never, it's not realistic to accept it. And of course, if the if you've got the people at the top, at more higher up, not inspired to start companies and make money and employ people, then what happens? Yeah, yeah. Well, then uh, it's the, a the, major gov the government have to set, and then so then it's a, a few major people problem. have to pay the It's a major. I grew up in the northeast where it's traditionally a Labour voting yes. type. Type, type background. So, um, do you think that where you grew up um, in Suffolk, way is is that is that typically Tory kind of? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, do you think that that had some influence on you? In yeah, I think it, I think it did. I think your parents and your grandparents have more influence. You know, sitting around the dinner table, you know, especially when they're in business, you're sitting there listening and learning, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, you don't yeah, know yeah. you are. You did the same, I'm sure. Yeah. 100%. You know, you sit and learn uh, and, and the challenges and the problems, you know, and and all the rest of it. Um, Ipswich, where, where, where um, I became chairman of Ipswich, Ipswich is traditionally Labour, it's a Labour seat. So to right. win it was, is quite difficult. So, yeah, Suffolk on the whole is Conservative, but Ipswich itself is Labour. The, the political football that is the affordable housing crisis. Yes. And that we've had so many different housing ministers only yes. in the last few years. 13 in 13 years, I think. Something like that. Good yeah. record. That I've met a few of them. Keep, <laughs> you met a few of them. Yeah. So what's the, why do we have this problem and what do you think that we can do to fix okay. it? Okay, well, first of all, I can never understand why they pick a housing minister There's nothing about housing. I mean, to me, that's absolutely crackers. I, I, you know, they, they say, the argument they say, they argue that, oh, well, they come with a fresh, a fresh look at it. Well, 
Do they? They don't know what they're doing. They've probably only bought two houses in the whole of their lives. So what the bloody hell do they know about it? Now, this government actually has done a lot more than people realise. Most people realise to help the housing situation. And what are the? How things? have they done that? Yeah. Homes England is a massive property bank run by this government, and it lends money, it lent 20 million to me to build the, the wine rack in Ipswich, 150 flats, which thank God we've sold. It's all about timing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so on. And, and, and they will now lend to, um, we're all considered, anybody that develops less than 250 houses a year or units a year is considered a small, small builder. So small, they will now go down and, and fund a deal for five houses. And they will look at schemes that the banks would not otherwise look at and support schemes. So um, that is a massive thing the government have done and doesn't get enough credit for it. Now, what will Labour do? Will they keep it going? I think they will because it also supports a hell of a lot of housing associations. So housing associations and councils are, lending, are borrowing money off Homes England. This, this government funds everything when you look at it. Yeah, yeah, Everything yeah. is funded by the government one way or the other. And then, you, and, and then of course, you've got, you know, you've got um, in 2012-13, we know what came in. Permitted development. Permitted development. And that was all the government as well because they got fed up with councils saying no, no, no. So they went yes, yes, yes. And they went yes, 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 a bit too radically perhaps and, and let a lot of, lot of rubbish be built. I mean... Architects will tell you they are the slums of the future these because they never had to do yeah. they never had to come do anything to the outside of these buildings. They all look like offices still, which is true to a point. And since then, they've I think they've lot they've they've to me they've um, diluted and made it harder. I think for um, developers, uh, some people think they've, they've, it's more you can be more flexible. It, you know you can do more things with shops and so on than you could have done. But actually, a lot of the shops and things that you technically now can convert to flats or residential should never be converted. Yeah, they yeah. should remain commercial, shouldn't they? Because, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you always should. I mean, there's one of the in particular that comes to mind, which is the MA, which is you can turn a retail shop into frontage into a, into a residential, which kind of just yeah. totally destroys the, the outlook on that parade. and. I, I think that's going too far, and, and and actually, you've got no probably got no you've probably got no back garden, no front garden. Why the bloody hell do you want to do it? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, it has helped in some ways because, um, well, in the fact that we have more units coming to market, we're supposed to be building three hundred thousand new units since two. We need five hundred thousand, and we're now at five hundred thousand. We to need keep up with the we backlog. need five hundred thousand. So, what, in your opinion, is the solution? Could be the solution, if it's well, it's not labour. Well, <laughs> not Labour, is it? I mean, Labour, la Labour think naively they're going to build a million. They they reckon they're going to build a million homes in the five years extra in the five years that they're going to hopefully they hope to be in in government now. Unless they radically change the planning system in the UK, that ain't going to happen anytime soon, because no one wants. Uh, a new estate in their back garden unless they own the land. You the NIMBYs. Unless you can CPO the land, which is what they did in the 1960s, of course, with Milton Keynes and places like that. You CPO'd it, compulsory Both purchased it, that, off farmers. Now, if you can do that at agricultural value, then you've got a chance to do something. But when he says, Starmer says, he's going to build a million more houses, he's not talking about houses that you live in. He's talking about social housing. Right. Because he doesn't believe anyone should own more than one house, remember. Socialist. So he's not talking about, you know, pr the private market. The private market is going to be stung. Do you remember when um, they brought in social housing for one in, th one in three houses built had to be social housing? That was done about 10 years, 12 years ago. Because, well, S106 is about 20%, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Like, so, they, one in so five. they, yeah, so, so it went to one in three. Right. It's now one in 10, unless, depending on the square footage or square meters, isn't it? But it went to one in three, and, and one or two developers um, went to court and got it changed again. 
and now that's why it's and then and then conservatives got in anyway. But I mean, that's what Labour were trying to do. One in three. So yeah, that's it, nuts. It's Apparently, nuts. I've heard that they're trying to do the uh, in the autumn budget. They were talking about the new PD, which is splitting the houses into two. Yeah, yeah. Ha but then they're also saying that one of them flats. has to be a social housing. <laughs> is that what they're saying? Yeah, <laughs> I haven't seen the detail. Devil is always in the detail with these things. I think they've make things up on the hoof and think, well, what are we going to do? They've got no experience. And, and, you know, I mean, I've been to meetings with housing ministers and other people. Um, modular was a great example. Modular is just... We're only building 3,000 modular <laughs> homes a year in the UK. It's an absolute joke. And the government... This was two or three years ago. Government are desperate to 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 support modular homes because they can build them much quicker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The problem is they're too expensive. They don't quite ca cotton onto that bit. Well, there's also like so. I, I think for me, the, what I've noticed is the the structural problem of the affordable housing crisis in the UK is is twofold. One's access to the capital, which has been yes. largely solved as so yeah. many. Private funders, private yeah, equity, yeah, Homes private England, debt, bridging, homes look at all the bridging companies, side, all, all the bridging companies. So that, that's yeah. kind of been solved. Yes, since I think Basel it has. III. Yeah, um, but now it's really the planning system. Yes, and you've got people like Dominic Cummings who's been pushing more, more PD in, onto us. Yeah, um, but maybe it's gone too far as well because now we're actually building substandard. Even yeah, the green minimum space standards are trying to tweak yeah, here and there. Yeah, they. Tr yes, but I we, think do we have to build on the green, green? Do we have to build on the green belt? Do we have to build on agricultural well, land? Well, what do you got to remember about green belt? Green belt covers 12% of the UK. 12%. 12% of UK land. A lot of green belt is rubbish. So uh, when I was at Cambridge United, I ended up buying the football club, the, the football ground. And we wanted to relocate the club uh, next door to a um, rough rubbish tip outside Cambridge. That rubbish tip and the land next door to it is in Greenbelt. No. The only thing you can build on Greenbelt is a park and ride. Council can cover it with tarmac, but no one else can do anything. Park and ride. So that's another story. But what I'm saying is a lot of the Greenbelt shouldn't be green belt and there's a lot of other areas that probably should be green belt so it needs to be looked at it needs the, to be reviewed the government it's like the rate system in the uk commercial rates in the uk that should have been looked at ages ago so should green belt there's so many things this government should have done partly they haven't done it partly because of covid and brexit and all these other things they've had to do but actually there's a lot of things they should have done and i think perhaps labor will look at these things and probably you know, when a, a new government hasn't been in power before for what 13 years, it has a it has a um, it has a window of opportunity for two or three years not to be criticised too much for doing things, and they can afford to be radical. And I think they probably will be. If you got offered the job as housing minister, would you take it? Definitely. They'd have to make me Lord John Howard first because I'm not an MP. I'd have to do a David Cameron and become a Lord. Fair play. But that's all right. They can do that within 48 hours. Yeah, exactly. And then I could be housing minister. That'd be great, wouldn't it? What, what, what I mean, what, like how, because they're giving it to all these people that don't, is it just career politicians that yeah, generally get totally, the... totally, totally, totally. You have no, do you have any interest in doing something like that? Love to, love to do that, love to do that. Um, well, let's see if we can get you there. Yeah, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Something to talk about off air. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, with property investment um, and development, You've mentioned trading is kind of your favourite thing to do yep. within all of that. I think um, we were talking about builders and, uh, yes. and, the, and the problematic kind of construction process yes. uh, just before we started. Um, a lot of people find it difficult right at the early stages, like how do I find a deal, deal sourcing? Mm. So do I. How do you solve that problem? This episode is sponsored by the PLMD Group. PLMD Group is made up of the PLMD Development, PLMD Estate Management, and PLMD Capital, providing expertise in real estate development combined with asset management. With more than 70 built-to-rent properties and £20 million of assets under management, PLMD's extensive knowledge of local planning policies have resulted in a strong track record, turning liabilities into valuable assets. The group delivers value through a fusion of experience, innovative design, Imagination, hands-on management, and sustainable resources. To find out more about PNMD and the services they offer, head to plmdgroup.co.uk.
I dedicate my life every day to finding deals. It's very difficult. It's very difficult. And you find no deals for six months and then two come along together. I, you know, they're like buses and then you can't find both and all the rest of it. <laughs> but uh, I, don't have the slight, I don't have that problem so much, I suppose, myself these days. But, you know, it is very difficult. And you, but you need to keep your standards up. You know, I have so many people who, you know, I try and help and they say, well, I've got this deal, got this deal. I said, well, it's not a deal. It's not good enough. And, they, and they're so desperate to hang on to that deal because they think they can't find another one. They've got to have more confidence in them, you know, within themselves in order to, 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 to find a different one or to reduce the, get the price reduced so it is a deal. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I, think, I think when the market is strong, like it has been, people will just buy things off, you know, property off right move and it will go up 10 or 15% in a year. I mean, any idiot can do that. That's not property developing, is it? Let's be honest. That's just... You could, you could be doing anything, you know. Um, you're looking, we're looking to add value and we're looking to make sure we can sell it 5% less what the agents tell you. Yeah. Because I own, I, you know, I was an estate agent. I eventually bought um, Auction House UK in 2009 and we and we we had um, four franchises. If you auction franchises, we built that up to forty-two. We sold. I sold my shares in it with my partner. Um, so we ran the Norfolk business ourselves, and then the rest were all franchised off. An auction house is the biggest. Is the number one auction house in the country on lots sold, not on the amount of money raised. So I'm proud of what we did with the auction house. But part of the deal was we also inherited an office in Norfolk, which was the Fine and Country office, which is a very good brand, yeah. a market brand. And we grew that to five offices, so we still own that business in Norfolk. Um, it's a really good business. And I vowed, of course, never to be a state agent again. Having, having bought the business off my father when I was 19, I then sold it when I was 24. Uh, I improved things. Um, and we were making money, and I sold it when I was, for not a fortune, but I sold it when I was 24, when I went full-time into property development. I see. So you actually bought that property from your father at 19. Yeah, I bought the business, yeah. Because he wanted to sell it. He wanted to retire. It wasn't well. Um, so I bought it off. What was him. the name of that estate agent? Um, I, cha I changed the name to John Howard Estate Agents because the reputation it had wasn't great. Yeah. So, you know, which was sad for your dad. And, you, you know, it's all that emotional bit. My mum, bless her heart, um, she persuaded him to sell it to me because he, he had another buy for it. Five or six thousand quid. It wasn't really. Uh, we're much. talking. You must be proud, though. You put your name above the door as well. And his yeah. Name's in well, there. I, well, of course, I I improved it quite a lot. So I'm not sure he's that proud or pleased about that. <laughs> it must it's be. a difficult <laughs> one, isn't it, for your father? It's difficult. It's a difficult one. But he was very old-fashioned. Didn't want to spend right. any money, and you know, and all the rest of it. So I I changed it up and and came up with some new ideas, and you know. Going back to the deal sourcing. Yes. Um, there's a. Most obvious ways that people talk about mm. are estate agents, yes. auction houses, yes. and direct to vendor yes. canvassing. Yes. Um, of those three, do you have a preference? Yes, direct to direct to vendor canvassing to me is finding a needle in a haystack. I know people do it, and I've got a friend of mine, Henry, in Liverpool, and he walks the streets of Liverpool, and he knows Margaret's husband died two weeks ago. Now, that was the old-fashioned way of doing yeah, it. Yeah. yeah? yeah, yeah. Um, or you need to be selling this, Margaret, now, you know, and all the rest <laughs> of it. Um, that was the old-fashioned way of doing it. Now it's all, it's all done on computers and this, that, and the other. I appreciate that. But to me, it's a hard old game trying to find a deal like that. But I know that's how some of the educators teach people to do it, and it's not a bad thing to do, but I just think it's a very long-winded thing to do. The auction market is the barometer and the heartbeat of the property market. When the auction market is tough, the rest of the property market follows six, nine months later. When it improves, it improves first with the auctions. If someone needs to sell, it's distressed. And the last five deals I've, I've bought, nearly all of them have been distressed off, 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 um, off banks. Because you're getting a, you're getting a bit of discount. Yeah. You're getting what you need. Um, and auctions, auctions are the barometer of the property market. So for me, people say, I can't find a deal. Well, there's 4,500 properties a month that go into auctions. There will be, an, a, there will be a deal 
in that catalogue you're looking at. It's up to you to find it, and it's up to you to find why it's in there and what the problem is. And it needs to be a problem you can solve. But there is a deal there. Now, I understand some people aren't fortunate enough to be able to come up with the deposit or yeah, the cash. cash yeah. I understand that, and people are and people are nervous about auctions, but they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be. If you're nervous about auctions, you're not a property developer, are you? Because yeah. I can tell you now, as a property developer, investor, developer, you're going to lose money at some point, unless you never sell anything. You're going to lose money at some point, and you, you have to deal with that, and you have, to, you have to make the most of it and move on. And if you're not prepared to buy an auction, to be honest with you, because you're worried about it, to be honest with you, I'm not sure you should be in the team. At the end of the day, if you're in business in general, <clears throat> there's a chance that you're going to lose some so, money along the way. Yeah, you've got to accept the fact that, you know, I spoke to a, a very, very successful friend of mine, far more successful than I'll ever be, and I said, genuinely, out of 10 deals, how many work? Seven. Seven work, one's a complete, utter disaster, and I'll lose a fortune on it, and two are, are, are embarrassing, but not that bad. That's what he said. Might break even on many. And, and I think, I to be honest with you, he's right. I would say, if you get seven out of ten right, that's not bad. I think that's in, in general in business. I, I think I saw, I saw a quote from Alan Sugar as well. Said thing you should need to have more wins than you've had losses, and then you're you you kind of you, you, that's winning. Yeah. I, I don't think you can be. I don't think you can be. You can be disappointed because you've lost money, and you can be cross with yourself. But I don't think it's, you should be losing confidence because you've learned from that mistake and hopefully hopefully you won't make the mistake again. There'll be another one, by the way, another mistake somewhere. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know, that's just life. You know, you can't win every time. Estate agents as a, as a way of finding deals? Yes. No, estate, in the old days, um, estate agents were much more flexible, shall we say, than they are today. You know, you, you get to know someone... They, they, get a, they get a property in that is distressed or whatever, and they give you a ring, say, look, I've got this, John, you can have it, blah, blah, blah. Now, it's slightly changed. Um, it, it, doesn't, it can work like that still to a point, but it's difficult. It's difficult for them with all the regulations, I think, um, and, and a lot of them are big corporates now, so it's very different. But the commercial agents, I think, are the ones to work with because I think... Uh, first of all, they're, most of them are charter surveyors. Their clients listen to them more. And not only that, but the type of properties they get, it's not someone's home they're living in. It's not their, you know, their, all the memories with it and everything else. It's probably a commercial property that you, you can convert into residential. It's probably been written down in their books in terms of what it's worth and all the rest of it. So I think, for me, I work with a number of commercial agents. I don't really work with many agents these days, state agents. Um, I work with some deal finders, and you call them something, you're young, you call them something different about a deal. I mean... Well, the, 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 the terminology that's come out of the last 10 years is are property sources. Yeah, I call them sorcerers. I call them I call state them agents. <laughs> I call them sorcerers because, they, because half the time it's, they're talking a load of, you know, it's never going to happen, off market. They've sent it to a 1,000 people. How the hell's that off market? It's bonkers. Off market is when you ring me and go... I've got a deal. I need 2% finder's fee. We pay everyone 2% finder's fee, by the way. And I would suggest if you don't pay anyone 2% finder's fee, you're not going to find any deals. I get people whinging to me, how do you find a deal and I don't? I say, well, do you pay them 2% finder's fee? Oh, I'm not paying that much. I say, well, that's life. There you go. You're not going to get any then, are you? So, I mean, I've got, I've got uh, three people who I work with quite closely. I trust them um, implicitly. And... I think one of them this year has earned 180 grand offers. Another one's earned 120. The other one, but I think, are these, are these, 60. These are strike me as um, professional. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are they yeah. commercial agents that are, yeah, that they, are bringing they, you a deal yeah, they on work, the buyer's yeah, side? Yeah, they, they're in the property. They are in the property, in, and it is an industry. Yeah. They are. They're in the property industry. I think. I mean, one of one used to have an estate agent. Now he just finds deals for me and one to other people. Um, another one's a commercial agent. Uh, another one is a, what I would call a little bit of a chancer. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I call it, you know, uh, but he's a real character. You know, and, and I don't see any characters, and it might be because of my age, but I don't see any characters coming into the property business anymore. I see a lot of intelligent people coming in that are, are, are educated in property by property educators, 
But if they've got the flair or the touch, that's another matter. I don't see the characters. I mean, when I look just in Ipswich alone, where I was based, or am based still, you know, there was about seven or eight of us of the same age, ducking and diving, doing deals, you know, staying out late at night, girlfriends, this, that, and the <laughs> other, ducking and diving, you know, Porsches and all the rest of it in your 20s. I don't see that anymore. Why do you think that is? I think regulation's got a bit to do with it. I mean, in the old days, you'd have an estate agent who would buy a property that he had to sell, he or she was, was given to sell. It, they'd buy it themselves and sell it on to you yeah. before they paid for it, you know, and all that sort of thing was going on. I'm sure it still goes on a little bit now, but, but I think regulation's got a lot to do with it. It was more cowboy country in those days. There's a new wave of estate agents these days where the American model is coming over. I'm not sure if you've... Uh, never worked. It's never worked, has it, in the UK? I, it, it's fascinating. I, I, I sat down with a guy who's doing really well out of the EXP model. Right. And the That's EXP model is where they're self-employed yep. and they will make 70% of everything that they earn yes. up to 80000 and anything above that, yep. they'll, be doing, uh, they'll be getting 100% of it. Well, You've got to pay 150 quid a month just to be part of it. Yes. About 100 pounds per listing fee yes. so they don't have to have the crazy yes. right move in the Zoopla costings. Do you know what? I've heard it all before. I've heard it all before. We, we w I would love to have all my listers, as we call them, going out there doing... I'd love them all to be self-employed. A friend of mine's doing it to a relatively successful level and he gives them 40% of every commission. But he has to support them for the first year 40%. financially. Yeah, but he financially supports yeah. them for the first year. I, 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 I know it's, in a, it's a brilliant system um, if you can make it work, but I've never met anyone who wants to do that. If anyone's really good on the whole, and I'm not talking about London, by the way, because London, Dubai, you know, that's yeah, a yeah, different yeah. market. I'm right, talking right. about outside London. If anyone's any good, they can earn very good money. So why are they going to do it? And most estate agents... They're nice people. They're pleasers. They're nice people. They want to please both parties. They don't like delivering bad news. And they're not very good businessmen. Wow. They love a car. <laughs> they love a nice car. And they spend what they earn. Yeah? And, I, and we've, you know, we, earn, we employ 42 of them. So, you know, they're all, and they're very good at what they do. Very good at what they do. But they couldn't, they can't, they can't, um, they can't see a deal for their lives. Because they it, ring you know, me and say, you know, oh, this is the deal. And I was like, no, it's not. You know, but they're very good at what they do. It's horses for courses. Yeah, exactly. I've noticed actually it's an estate agent that's trying to get the top money for, an, uh, for the seller. They're not very good at getting, they're not programmed to find a deal per no, se. They're not. There are they're, few they're, it's a different here. animal. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So um, property portfolios. Yes. Income producing. Yes. Building a portfolio, building a pension fund, yep. which is what some people look at. Yes. It. Um, do you recommend that? Yes. I recommend you do a bit of everything. Okay. Because I think over the years, that stood me in pretty good stead. So I've got a, a portfolio across the UK, um, which helps pay a lot of my overheads and also pays a lot of the in bank interest on developments. So we try to pay the interest quarterly, so we don't roll it up to the end. Why do you do why is that? We try and pay it quarterly because we get a, a cheaper rate and it's more responsible to do. It's less risky. We don't do it on every development, but we do it on as many as we can, and we can do that because of our rental income, surplus to what, you know. So, uh, but, uh, so I think a, a, a rental portfolio is great. Some development is great because it's capital... It's uh, you're gaining capital, hopefully, if it goes well, uh, rather than just waiting for inflation on the other side of it. So I think a combination of both, and I think a bit of commercial is a good thing as well. So I think a combination of all three, commercial, residential portfolio, and development, is the perfect scenario. And that's what, you know, that's what um, I've, I've tried to do. And one step further, um, investing locally or... Far away. Well, I, well, well I've, I, I don't know whether I've got it right or wrong. Okay, because I've always bought all over the UK, and I've got, I'm just telling you, I've got two deals in Scotland at the moment, yeah. and one in Wales, and all the rest of it. And I'm just about to buy something in the Isle of Man. Oh, nice. Nice. 
less banks will fund the things in the island. I was about to say, how did you get that funded? Yeah, well, well I haven't yet, but, I, <laughs> but I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, so, so uh, yeah, so I've spread my risk everywhere. Now, in 1990, I've survived three property recessions. In 1990, it was bad. Uh, East Anglia went down 35%. Ouch. Not many people survived that. In the Midlands, it went down 20%. In the North, it went down 15%. And we had properties all over the place. So actually, we survived it. If it was just all in East Anglia, we'd have been in serious, right. serious trouble. Now, however, I've got friends. I've traveled thousands of miles. I can't tell you how many miles I've traveled over 40 years. Someone very bright can work it out. He's good at maths, probably. Not me. But I have, I have you know, been everywhere looking at deals and so on. Yet I've got friends who have only bought probably in one town or two towns, they've probably made as much money as me. So who's the mug and who isn't, I don't know. So uh, I, think, I think it's whatever you're comfortable with. The great thing about being local, I always say to people, if you can start local, start local, because you've got the contacts, yeah, yeah. you've got more confidence, you can go and see it, you've got another job. Please don't go giving your job up unless you've got at least 10 properties. Please. I get these announcements on LinkedIn, don't you, and things. I'm now a full-time property developer. Congratulations. How many deals are you doing at the moment? One. Well, what are you going to do the rest of the time? So, you know, be sensible. The great thing about property, especially if, you, if, it, if you're investing in property, you don't ever need to give your job up. I, I did a seminar the other day, and I get um, mostly... I don't get many people with, with, with out funds coming. I get people who have got property and want to do more. Right, I right. do about three of these seminars a year. I don't do many. Uh, and um, and there was a doctor who came, and his father has built up a, a portfolio of 100 properties. Nice. And he obviously needs to know more about it to take over. So just, and, he's a, and, he's, uh, and, and he was still a doctor, and his father was still a doctor. So it just shows you what you can do, if, if, and they're all local to them, and they have to be local to be able to do that. I understand that. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. So, then, it, it, but that's amazing. Uh, and, that, you know, what a good effort that is. Seriously good effort. The time to, to travel, I, I think, is only if you've got nothing else going on. So if, you, if you're a dentist or a doctor yes. and you've got your, your business that's giving you your general income and then you're reinvesting yes. that in the property, it probably makes more yes. sense to just do things locally to I, Well, it management. does because... But I understand if you've only got a limited, a limited deposit, then going to the northeast or going, you know... The will, the will, you know, is really cheap. The will near Liverpool, yeah, yeah, yeah. amazingly cheap. And the area, and the, and actually, the areas around there, and the properties and the villages around there, are very nice. Yet property prices are incredibly low. And the yield is good, so you and get the better yield, cash flow. And the yield is good. And the yield is good. Although, of course, at the moment, unless you've got fifty percent deposit, you've got a problem with that. With interest rates at seven percent on on in, you know investment, it's difficult to that game is that game is sort of over in my view. And for the moment, unless you're unless you're buying, say a develop, it says you're developing three properties, uh, selling two, keeping one, refinancing, and you can do that. But I think just to go and buy a property and expect not to have to put 40, 50 percent deposit down is pretty naive. And with your crystal ball, I'm oh, saying yeah. survive till 2025. Do you think that we'll start seeing interest rates kind of creep back down? I think I think next year. To, I mean, what do I know? I'm no economist, but I think the second half of next year will look better. But of course, there'll be a general election. And what happens in a general election year? Do you know what happens in general election year? No. It's the biggest excuse for everyone to do nothing. Nothing. So, oh, well, I don't think we'll move yet because we don't know who's going to be in government. Right, right, who? Right. It doesn't matter to most people who the hell's in government for the first year, does it? So, but they'll use it as an excuse, negativity, you know, it, it really, stagnation comes in when people think there's an election. So Is that a great time to be in the market then? Because you see the stagnation, you see a little bit of distress, and then you can capitalise They say, on never catch a falling knife. So when the market's falling, share's falling, wait till it bounces off the floor. And for most people, that's what they need to do. You know, I do trade in a falling market, but it's tricky and it's difficult and I remember in the 90s, I, early 90s, I was doing it. And to be quite honest with you, I got the chance to go away with Rachel. Rachel? She was beautiful. 
and I had the chance to go away with her. She wants to go to Australia for six months travelling or something, yeah? <laughs> and I said no because I'm dealing in property. In those six months, I lost money. Wow. And, so, you, and you lost the girl. Lost the girl. Should have gone. <laughs> Should have gone, shouldn't I? Big mistake. Bloody hands from the fallen knife. There you go. I should have waited for it to bounce off the floor. I think when you're trading, yes, you've got to be really, really careful. Yeah. I think when you're buying, because I was always told from day one when I got my first day as a yeah. uh, job as a state agent, property is a marathon, not a sprint. And it, generally the money that I've made yeah. is over the long term. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. If you're, I mean, if you're buying for the long term, does it matter if it goes down another 10% yeah. and then goes back up again? I mean, on average, the market's gone up 5% in the last 25 years. But of course, during that time, there's been big drops as downs. well, drops and downs. So I, 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 I'm not, I don't disagree with you, but we all want a deal, don't we? We all want a deal. We all want a deal. <laughs> and, and by the way, when you're selling, always leave something in for the next person. Yes. That's what I always taught. Absolutely. Always leave something in for the next person. I can't tell you how many people don't believe that. And even my stepdaughter, who's in the business now, goes, why are you selling? Yeah, of course, she knows more than me already. Um, why are you selling that for that price? We could get another 30 grand for it. Yeah, but I want to do deals with that guy yeah. again or, or that lady again. They'll come back for another deal because they've had a deal and they've made money. And that's maybe a bit of an old-fashioned attitude, I but think I it's think the right it's the way. right one. Yeah, I think it's the right way. Tell me about how being a TV superstar has changed your life. <laughs> Well, what happened was, uh, I wish I was, of course, and I wish I was getting paid better for it. But anyway, so what happened was, how it all came about, I wrote a book. I've written five books. I wrote a book uh, about um, buying and selling property, really. Um, and I wrote it because I was so fed up with hearing all the rubbish from so-called experts who have done two deals. You know, never seen a recession, never seen it. And I, and I, and I thought... Hang on a minute, I know more than these people. Because, uh, And then I realised that everyone was doing this property education. I never realised it was going on. Just a hard-nosed property developer <laughs> yeah. with all my friends who are hard-nosed property developers. I won't use the word bastard, but you could <laughs> use that. And yeah, I never realised this was all going on. People were making fortunes. So uh, I wrote a book and then um, Property TV got in touch with me and said, look, would you like to come in and, and do, they do a property question time, which is a, a great show. It's been going quite a while now. And property TV is only, a, you know, it's just a very modest little TV setup. But it's, it's good, it's good, and it's on Sky. So I said, okay, I'll come in. Anyway, I came in. Um, the training goes like this. Five, four, three, two, <laughs> you're on. Right, that's it. No training. And, and, I've, and, and they send you the questions the night before. So I'd look at the questions, so oh, that's all right. And now I don't bother looking at the questions the night before. It doesn't bother me. I would find it actually it's better if you don't know the questions. It's more exciting. <laughs> yeah. But, of course, some people can't answer the bloody things. But I felt I could – I found that, one, I found it quite easy. Two, uh, people thought I was quite engaging. Indeed. And uh, I tried to keep it upbeat and amusing. Um, and, my God, there's some boring people about, aren't there? I mean – and then I started doing these talks and things. Uh, the people asked me to talk. I thought, well, I'm going to talk – I don't mind talking, <clears throat> but I'm not monetizing it. I'm just, you know, I'm not getting paid for, yeah, 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 you know, yeah. it's nice to meet people. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I'll do a few seminars. And that's all I do. I do three or four a year. I do a little bit of mentorship, not a lot because I'm busy. I've got three or four very nice people, a footballer and one or two others. Um, I've got room for a few more, but not many because I'm, I'm doing my own stuff still. Uh, and, and these educators, I mean, they do the free event and then they do this. And they do, I don't do any of that. I just do one event and that's it. Um, but, but, I, but I found it that, you know, people quite li like listening to me. And, and, and um, so then that, they probably TV came to me and said, do you got any ideas for a show? So I said, yes. And they said, well, what is it? Um, well, anyway, I, I, I came up with a, like, a bit like... The, Dragon's Den, really, isn't it? So Very much. I have one of my, one of my favorite TV shows. Yeah, well. yeah. Love so it. so then I thought, well, uh, what I'll do, I'll, so we, Property TV, um, uh, we owned it 50-50, and oh, people came, people paid us to come on the show. So I got paid by the other angels to come on the show because they, they can do a deal and it's yeah, good yeah, for yeah, profile. Yeah. Anyway, but then Ranjan, because, of course... He thinks he's the star. He's not the star, but he thinks he is. 
Um, Ranjan said, well, hang on a minute, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I'm the star of it all and, and I'm, not, I'm paying to come. Why am I paying you to be on? I said, tell you what I'll do. I'll buy, the, I'll buy the other half off Property TV and I'll sell it to you lot. How's that? And that way there's no argument. We're all in it together. We've all got shares and sponsorship because we you know, we've got a very good sponsor. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's now got better as the years have gone by. We've invested more money and, and we know what we're doing more now. Uh, sort of, and uh, so so that's really how it came about. So now there's five, four prima donnas and me, <laughs> uh, and I, I I still pull it all together, and I'm the chairman. Um, I wasn't very well earlier this year, so I couldn't really be in Series Six, and uh, Ranjan took over as chairman. He did a pretty poor job. Uh, so but anyway, I'm back for Series Seven. We film in February. And the deals that you do, because um, yeah. I know you've, you've invested in a fair few. Yes. Um, is it that one uh, seven out of ten type thing? No, it's very, very hard. It's like Dragon's Den. In fact, I met the producers of Dragon's Den a while ago for obvious reasons, which I'm sure yeah. you can guess. Uh, and, and they were saying that very few of Dragon's Den deals ever, ever get done. And I'm afraid it's a little bit the same with the us. I don't want mis- yeah, yeah, yeah. to mislead people. We do, we have done deals. Um, the difficulty is that it's not quite what it says sometimes on the deal falls through or whatever it might be. But what I would say, one, it's an educational show. Definitely. That's the first thing. And the second thing is those people who we engage with, quite often we do a deal with, another deal with, later on. So you build that bridge, build so that relationship. you build that bridge. And the best one at that is Nicholas Warwork. I, shouldn't, I hate saying it, but it's true. So Nicholas is really good at um, may not, maybe not doing the deal that he's agreed to do because it hasn't worked out, but f- they find another one or he finds them and does it with them. He's very good like that. Um, I'm a bit more hard-nosed about it, uh, but we all have to have a different persona for the show. I've always been very boring. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, well, that's, so, that's, yeah it's it's got to be entertainment um, yeah, and educational, which creates it's the engagement. Be, it's got it's to it's have both, and, and I think it has. With the, with the, so then I thought what I could do, I ought to do a show on my own rather than all these other lot. So uh, I came up with the property graduate. Which is the, property, uh, which is the apprentice kind which of Which is uh, like the model. apprentice, yeah. Well, you say it is. I can't possibly comment. So with that show... Um, what I've, so what we do there, I give, um, um, I, I put up a million pounds worth of funding, and we share the profit 50-50 to the that's winner. An amazing deal. But they've got to go and find a deal, and that's the hard bit. So Alfie won the first year; he's got a deal in Hungerford. We're doing that now. Uh, Tristan is struggling to find a deal. The second guy, not because he's not good; it's just the market, yeah, sure, and we've sure. got high it's standards. Um, and the and the person who is going to win win this year still going on the show at the moment. I won't say who. Um, I nearly did then, so I nearly made a big four par. <laughs> I would not be happy. Um, you know, the, the, the people that come on the show, we have two or three hundred people apply. Um, wow. And, you know, it, again, it, it's a TV show, so you do need a mixture of people on it uh, different from different backgrounds and all the. And we've had a 17-year-old on it, and we've had a 65-year-old doctor on it. So it's amazing, and... And it's humbling when you get that many applicants and you read, read their story as well. And we try and pick a good balance, but it isn't, you know, we take 18 or 20 people through to the live event. I mean, from doing property trading and from doing property development and being an estate agent, is this something a little bit different that just keeps you interested and keeps you intrigued and keeps yeah, you... Yeah, because my main business partner retired last year. Um, and um, if, if I hadn't started doing some of the property stuff, the TV stuff and speaking and that sort of stuff. I'd have probably not retired, but I'd probably gone the same way as him. He's an old man. Yeah, He's an yeah. old man. He's 63. I feel like I'm 33. Right. So, you know, um, but he wasn't a counselor. He isn't a counselor. So He's a bit steady anyway. But uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so it's given me a new lease of life in a way. And also, I enjoy working with Ranjan. I hate, don't tell him that, but <laughs> Ranjan. And we actually can do a pod, we, we're going to do a little uh, YouTube show together. He's told, so he tells me. But he says he's got to have his name first before mine. I said, that's absolutely fine. I said, we know he's got the ego. The Lennon so. McCartney syndrome. Yeah, that's right. We know, I said, I'm not, I haven't got an ego. It's fine. Um, 
And so, so um, yeah, so I, I enjoy, you know, working with Paul, Paul Mahoney. He's a seriously bright guy, the Australian. He's, yeah. I mean, he's an amazing, in, 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 interesting, intellectual guy. Um, Nicholas Warwick's great. Hayley Andrews is really good. Yeah. She's, the, she's the queen of Dudley. She owns everything in Dudley, from what I can see. Um, very successful. She's the um, one that introduced us as well. Yeah, yes, that's right. She did. Yeah, she's lovely, isn't she? Yeah, bright lady, bright lady. In fact, she texted me this morning and said, "Oh, good luck, and uh, I've got a deal for you in Dudley." There's not many. I thought she took all the deals, so obviously it's something she <laughs> doesn't. Want. She doesn't want it. So you know, that's. Uh, I don't. So I'm not sure about that one, but um, we'll see. So yeah, no, I've met some, and and I've met so many inspiring people as well through. Through through doing the shows, you know, and it gives you a bit of a buzz, and yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's good fun. Good, good, good. fun. So, um, if I was to ask you, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? What would you say? Uh, always keep your money moving. If I was to ask you, what's the worst piece of advice you've received? What would you say? Don't become a property developer. <laughs> Good. Which is what my father said, <laughs> bless his heart. He's very cautious, you know, he didn't want to. But on the bit of keeping the money moving, so many people get stuck, especially at the moment. So they might have quite a large portfolio. But, of course, the banks are saying, oh, your, your, your facility's up. We're going to reduce the loan to value from 70, 65% to 50 or whatever. So they've yeah, you've got yeah. no cash. So... You know, and, they, and they're very reticent about selling anything, which I understand. But I was always taught by two very successful property guys, John, always keep some money moving. Always keep something in an auction. Keep it going because you never know when you're going to need that money. And right, if you'll right, get right. to the point where you just can't move at all, that's a major problem. Even if you've got loads of assets, you can't take those assets down to Tesco's and say, I want to buy some bread with it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, need yeah. to keep the keep the money moving. Which is stay liquid as much as you can. Uh, yeah, to a point, to a point. I mean, you're obviously a successful property person. This show is called Property People. Yes. What advice would you give people um, to become successful in property and to become a property person in the future? Well, my wife what says... What characteristics I've... or traits okay. are there? Anyway? Well, my wife says I've got one talent only. Go on. And that's dogged determination. So mentally, I'm very consistent. So I'm not running around like an idiot for a week and then sitting on my backside for three weeks. I'm on it every day. I'm consistent. And it's all about contacts, all about who you know, who you can sell to, who you can buy off. It's all about contacts. And I think these property shows, sorry, property events that I speak at and so on uh, around the country are very good. You know, the evening events, you get to know people. And I think n people don't trade enough between each other. And I think part of that these days is because they're emailing all the bloody time and not picking the phone up, having a bit of banter, having a coffee, having a bite to eat. You know, they, they're much more sort of standoffish than I think we ever were. They need to press the flesh. I think they do, more so. Um, and some people are better at it than others. I accept that, totally. Um, but I think it does help. To, to, to meet people. And you're not going to get on and work with everyone. Sure. But if you can pick two or three people out that you can, you can have a rapport with and you trust and you can work with and they find you deals, especially if those deals are different to the ones that you want to do. So you find something that isn't for you, but it might be for them. You get a fee out of it or whatever, a bit of walkabout, yeah, as we yeah. call it, walkabout, and vice versa. And that's what it's about. It's having a network of people who will trade with you. And I don't see anyone virtually anyone trading with anyone these days. They're all very blinkered and just buy it off the agent and that's it. They won't sell it. They won't do this. They won't do that. Come on, guys. Let's have some deals. Well, I'd like to attend one of these seminars as well and come down. You're and... very welcome to. You're very, very welcome. We all get organised. Thank you so much. John, the pleasure's been all mine. Um, I no, think... it's been great fun. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I think you've got uh, a wealth of experience that I think a lot of people are going to really benefit from. And I'd love to keep in touch with you and, and see how the market goes and all your efforts and, and keep following you on Property uh, TV. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Pat. Thank you.